Okay, so this is a walkthrough of the steps involved in protein synthesis. So in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes, there are some differences. Both of them have the two major steps you can see here. Transcription is step one, translation is step two. But notice that in eukaryotes, a couple of things. One, transcription in eukaryotes occurs in the nucleus, and then the RNA gets processed before it ever leaves and goes to the ribosomes for translation. Whereas in a prokaryote, the two steps, transcription and translation, both happen in the cytoplasm because there is no nucleus, and this step of RNA processing doesn't happen. So that's a little overview. All right, so transcription is the process by which mRNA, or messenger RNA, makes a copy of a portion of DNA. So you have this whole DNA strand, and what's going to happen is somewhere along this long DNA strand, there's the gene that we want to copy. Uh, so unlike replication, where the entire DNA strand is going to open up and get copied, a little section of this giant DNA is going to open up and get copied. And that's going to be controlled by what we call transcription factors, which we'll talk about later, that control the turning on and turning off of sections of DNA. So when the DNA opens up, What's going to happen is um, RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme like DNA polymerase, is going to make a copy of just one little section of the DNA. It's going to build a little 5 to 3 mRNA, 5 prime to 3 prime mRNA molecule. Notice that it's single stranded. And um, remember that there's a, a order to the connections here. So if the DNA, for example, has an A, the mRNA is going to make a U. Uh, because remember, RNA does not have the, ba the base thymine or T. If there's a T in the DNA, the mRNA is going to have an A. A G in the DNA would match to a C, and a C would attach to a G. So there is a match in the mRNA, or a complement to the DNA code. So the mRNA is going to come in, and it's going to make a copy of this little section of the DNA. There are sequences called promoters that tell it where to start and terminator sequences that tell it where to start, to stop. And in eukaryotes, the pr promoter contains something called a TATA box. It's just a, like a code that sort of is um, almost like a little bullseye that says to start here. And that tells the mRNA where uh, to begin copying. That's why in your DNA, you may have long stretches of DNA that's your DNA may be on one chromosome 100,000 bases long. But scientists have been able to map out where certain genes are because they can recognize, oh, wait, here's a promoter. This must signal that there's a gene in this area. Oh, and here's a terminator. And so the scientists have been able to find areas of DNA where there are genes and other areas of DNA where there might not be any kind of genes. It's just kind of junk there, you know, codes that don't actually code for anything. And this is a little picture of it. So the DNA is opened up. And this is our, our mRNA in red, making a copy of just one side of the DNA, not both sides, and not the entire DNA, just a little section. Now, in prokaryotes, um, that's it. Transcription is done, and we're going to move on to the second step. However, in eukaryotes, which remember includes the cells that make up us and plants and funguses, the mRNA gets modified before it leaves the nucleus. How does it get modified? Well, a couple of things. One thing that's going to happen is it's going to get a cap on the 5' prime end, which is, uh, it happens to be a G. And on the other end, it's going to get what's called a poly A tail, which is sort of a section of a bunch of A's, adenines. And the purpose of this, it helps to export it from the nucleus, and it also prevents enzymes from breaking it down too quickly. Because once it leaves the nucleus, there are enzymes in the cytoplasm that will break this mRNA down. Because if the mRNA just stayed there forever, it could keep making more and more and more proteins and we'd make too much. So when we make an mRNA, it only lasts for a certain amount of time and then it's going to get broken down. The other thing that happens, and this is important, is that we have these things called spliceosomes, which sounds like a word I made up, but it is a real word. And spliceosomes will actually come in and splice or cut the mRNA. So in other words, if this was my original mRNA here, Literally, these spliceosomes will come in and take sections of the mRNA out, sections that 
they don't want there, that don't maybe don't code for anything. And so these pieces that get cut out are called introns. They literally get left inside the cell. The nucleotides just get recycled. And then these pieces here, they're called exons, and they will literally get spliced together into a final mRNA molecule. And this final molecule will leave the nucleus. So the original mRNA might have been a thousand base pairs long, but the final one, after we cut chunks out of it, might only be 700 base pairs long. And so this is significant. We also know that you could actually cut these uh, mRNAs in different ways and make multiple different kinds of proteins. So just like how I could take a sentence and take certain words out of it, take the word not out of it, for example, and I could completely change the meaning of the sentence. So you could have the same original mRNA, and by splicing it different ways, you can make different final products. This picture shows spliceosomes. You will not see pictures of anything like this on a test, but it's just showing how chunks get cut out. And you can see in, on the right side, introns and exons, and how the final mRNA might be a lot shorter than the original piece that you started with. And here's another picture of it, showing the um, five prime cap on the left and the poly A tail on the right, and then all the bases in the middle. Our second step is translation. In translation, mRNA is going to leave the nucleus and it's going to go to the ribosomes. And once it gets to the ribosomes, the ribosomes are literally going to hold it in place. I don't know if you remember, but cells, the ribosomes are actually made of two pieces, not one. A little piece and a bigger piece. And literally what the ribosomes are going to do is they are going to hold this mRNA in place so it can be read in the next step. So a ribosome is not really a, a, um, an organelle with a job going on inside of it. It's more like a piece of machinery that's helping the process going on outside of it. The mRNAs are going to be read three letters at a time. Now those three letters are called codons, and this is really important. Each three letter codon is going to code for a specific amino acid. And there's a star codon. So even though you've made this long mRNA, Technically, it's not going to start reading this mRNA until it sees the code AUG. It's going to ignore everything before that, and when it sees AUG, that's the star codon. It codes for the amino acid methionine, and that basically means start here, and then it's going to start reading three letters at a time, all the way down the mRNA to the end. There are actually 64 different codes, and these are the 64 codes. You need to be able to read this on a test. So for example, if we were doing the code AUG, you take your first letter, A, and you find it on the left side of the chart. So here's A. So that tells us that the code we're looking for comes from this row. Now our second letter was U. We use the top to find the second letter. So here's U. That tells us we're looking in this column. And now once you've got your row and your column, that basically highlights one box, and here it is, AUG, which codes for methionine. And I'll show you one more. Let's say the code was CUA. Then our first letter is C. So here's C. That tells us it's this row. U is our second letter. That tells us it's this column. And that means it's this box. And here's CUA, which codes for leucine. And these three-letter abbreviations are for the amino acids, like this is serine tyrosine, this is histidine, this is lysine. You don't have to know those. Some charts will actually have the names written out and some will have the three letter abbreviations. Also notice there are three codes that code for stop uh, and we'll come back to that. One other thing I want to show you, even though there's 64 codes, notice that they don't all code for different things. There are not 64 amino acids. There's actually only 20. So for example, if I come over here to this box, C-U-U, C-U-C, C-U-A, C-U-G, all code for leucine. And you can see this throughout, A-C-U, A-C-C, A-C-A, A-C-G, they all code for threonine. So a lot of times, specifically the third letter in particular, can be changed and still code for the same thing. We'll come back to that in a minute. This is another version of the code. This one you read starting from the inside out. So if the code was A-U-G, you'd look here in the middle, find your A, that gives us our quadrant. Our second letter is U, so within this quadrant, here's the U, and here's AUG. I like this one, it's cute, but it's not usually the one I've ever seen on an AP exam. 
All right. So now comes the tRNA. So tRNAs, they have what's called an anticodon. So this is a picture of a tRNA here, and you'll see that on one side of the tRNA is a specific amino acid, and on the other side is a three-letter code. That three-letter code is a match or an anticodon that matches with the codon on the mRNA. So if we go down here to our ribosome, you'll see how our codon was AAA. The anticodon is going to be the match to that, U, U, U. Our second one, G, U, A. G goes to C, A goes to U, U goes to A. So our anticodon, it's almost like going back to the DNA again. You have to um, make the match to the letter. So these tRNAs are bringing in amino acids and they're dropping them off. And notice what's happening here. We have a protein that's being formed. And that's our goal. The whole point of this entire process is that we're adding amino acids and we're building a specific protein. So this is a, another picture on the left here showing more like what a tRNA really looks like. The anticodon is at the bottom, you'll see, and at the top is where the amino acid would attach. All right, so the tRNAs, when they combine with the mRNA, they drop off an amino acid, and then they can leave and go pick up another one. The tRNA, it has to go, when it goes to find another amino acid, enzymes are involved in that. You will not be asked about the amino acyl tRNA synthase, which is the name of the enzyme. Um, you don't have to know the name of that enzyme. But just know that the tRNAs are reusable. When they drop off an amino acid, they'll go back and they'll pick up another one and they'll just keep coming back. And what's going to stop the protein at the end is what's literally called a stop codon. When it gets to one of those codes, there's no tRNA for that. And so it, when it gets there, that basically signals the protein to break off. And uh, once that happens, it will get modified. So there are 20 amino acids, but there are only 45 tRNAs. It turns out that the tRNAs use a fifth base. We've learned A, T, G, C, and U. Well, tRNA has another base it can have called I. And for example, if the code on a tRNA was CCI, I is not as specific as the other ones. In other words, how we talked about how G only connects to C, but I can actually connect to U, C, or A. So you can see where this, what, what this leads to is what's called wobble, and you do need to know what wobble is. And wobble is the flexibility of the code, meaning I could change the third letter. If my code was G, G, U, that would connect to C, C, I. If I had a mutation and it got changed to G, G, C, it would still connect to CCI and it would still make the same amino acid. So wobble refers to the fact that in particular in the third base of the codons, we can actually change the letter and still make the same thing. And it makes the code a little bit, or the tRNA is kind of flexible. This is just a picture summarizing everything. In the nucleus you have transcription and outside you have translation. This exact picture will be used on your test for matching. So you should go to the PowerPoint and maybe screenshot it. It's also on the worksheet that you've been working on. Once the protein is made, it will fold up on its own because of the R groups. Remember that each amino acid has an R group, and the R groups react with each other to make tertiary structures, so the protein will fold into its shape. Um, it can get modified by becoming a glycoprotein or a lipoprotein. It can get cut. It can be joined with other strands. All of that stuff would happen in the ER or maybe in the Golgi bodies, and then the protein would either stay in the cell or it would get exported to be used somewhere else, like a lot of the hormones you make. Your cell makes them, and then they go to a different cell for their reaction. So to summarize, there's 20 amino acids. There's 64 codes, but only 45 tRNAs because of wobble, the fact that some tRNAs can bind to multiple things. There are start and stop codes. You should know the start code is AUG. The stop codes, there's three of them. You don't have to memorize what they are. And the code is universal, meaning if I take the DNA from a jellyfish, for example, that codes to make glowing proteins, and I put that gene into a fish, I can make glowfish, which is exactly what they've done. They're genetically modified organisms. Why does it work? Because the DNA code is read the same in any organism. So you could make a glowing plant, a glowing fish, a glowing bacteria, a glowing person in theory because the DNA code is universal. It's, it's translated into the same protein no matter what organism you put it in.